Are you a person that likes change? I think I like change, but perhaps I'm a little bit more conservative than others. I know a lot of people love change for change's sake. They like to be out at the forefront of what's going on in the field and all the new and up, up and coming things. Whereas I'm kind of like, well, I like this method. Why would I change away from it? Do you give me a good reason? Well, in the field of data viz, change is a constant. Well, one of those changes was the advent of what's called a violin plot as an alternative to a box plot. What's a violin plot? Why might you choose a violin plot over a box plot? Why might you prefer a box plot? Well, stay tuned and we'll cover all that in today's episode of Code Club. A few years ago, violin plots were kind of all the rage on Twitter. Uh, people were really excited to show the shape of their oddly distributed data using what's called a violin plot. What is a violin plot? Great, I've mentioned violin about 10 times now without saying anything about what it is. You can think of a violin plot as a histogram that instead of being arrayed on the x-axis is arrayed on the y-axis and then it's mirrored on either side of um, a point on the x-axis, giving it kind of an hourglass shape or perhaps a football shape or perhaps something that looks like the body of a violin, hence a violin plot, right? And so it's showing you the shape of the distribution of the data um, in the actual curvature of uh, the violin body or of, of the shape that it's presenting. Whereas a box and whisker plot, the box plot is a box, right? It's a rectangle. It shows you where 50% of the data are, whereas the violin plot shows you where there's more data than in other places. Uh, and so if your data are highly skewed, then you might get something that, um, you know, is kind of flat on the end and peaky uh, up towards the top. Anyway, that's what a violin plot is. And today we're going to go through how you would go about implementing the code to generate a violin plot, strengths and weaknesses, and maybe we'll do a head-to-head -head comparison, comparing what we've currently got with the box plot to what we can generate using the violin plot. So if you'd like to join me as I work through all my code here in our studio, uh, down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post that has the code that I'm starting with here. And so again, you'd be able to work along in parallel with me. Also along the top here is a link to a video I did earlier in this series of episodes describing how you can get R, R Studio, install the Tidyverse, and how you can get the data that I'm working with and set up your R Studio project so that you can seamlessly work alongside me. Here I've got my schubertdiversity.r script. This generates the strip chart with a box indicating where uh, the intraquartile range is. I'm gonna go ahead and change what I'm outputting this to. So I will change the name of the output file to schubertdiversitybox.tiff. I'm gonna go ahead and load everything so I've got it and I'll show you what we get for the output. Here is what we finished with after the last episode where we've got the data um, laid out, again, within each of the categories, the position on the x-axis is random, um, and the box, the outside of the box, indicates the intraquartile range, the, the space between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. The thicker solid line in the middle is the median or the 50th percentile. So I've got this, and we'll come back to this later in the episode. For now, I'm gonna go ahead back to my code and I'm gonna change box to violin. And whenever we update, we will also update that. All right, so in our code again, we are loading our packages, we're getting the metadata um, off an Excel spreadsheet, we're reading in our alpha diversity data, joining it all together, getting colors, getting counts, all that good stuff. And then we come here to the code for our box plot um, and our jitter plot. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to comment out the uh, the code to build the box plot as well as the code to put up the points and let's start with the violin plot so we'll do a geom violin open close parentheses add that and voila we have our violin plots um, they look perhaps a little bit more like dulcimers than violins um, but you know you, you get the idea that the, there's more points kind of where the plot where the shape is wider and fewer points up where it's more narrow I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the legend so we have more real estate here in our figure. And also because, as I've mentioned in the past, um, the, the color, uh, there's only one color per column and that corresponds to the name on uh, the, the x-axis. We've got our three violin bodies. And again, it shows us where the data fall. Um, one critique I have of this that we'll come back to is that I think this doesn't so much show you where the central tendency of the data is, where the median or the mean is, but it shows you more of like where the mode is, right? So where it's the widest, which is what my eye is drawn to. Again, humans are drawn to area. Um, that that I say, though, well, this is really important down here. And so for some reason, you know, I think, well, you know, the, the, 
the C. diff positive individuals have higher inverse Simpson index than people that have diarrhea but are C. diff negative. Um, but that's where the mode is, not necessarily where the central tendency or like the median of the data are. So that's something that we'll come back to as we go through this episode. I'd like to add the data. So let's go ahead and return our geom jitter and I'll keep everything the same. One of the first things I notice about this plot is that the distribution of the points in my jitter plot is different than the distribution of points in the violin body. That the, the X distribution is uniform across the Y axis. And so we get a column, whereas we get a violin shape or dulcimer shape um, for the violin body of the dis distribution. An alternative plot to the strip chart is something called a sina plot, where it jitters, but it jitters within the shape of the violin. Um, that's something that you can do in another package that's related to the tidyverse. I'm going to use an alternative to the jitter plot and the sina plot that will give us a similar type of effect that I think might also be effective. And that's a, a, bot, a dot plot. So for now, I'll go ahead and comment out geom jitter and I'll add geom dot plot. And what the geom dot plot does is it'll put across the x axis my different categories. And then in the y axis, it'll put the points next to each other. But to do that, it's got to bin the y axis um, discreetly rather than continuously like we currently have it. I'll show you what, what this looks like. So we'll go ahead and run this. So it's complaining uh, that it's missing uh, the missing aesthetic y. And so what I need to do is put in bin axis equals y. And that will then bin the y axis. And what we can see is that it is binning the y axis. Let me go ahead and show, show legend false. And so now we, we can see what's going on that kind of starting at the midline of our violin body, it's then putting points going out. And it's breaking this up, as it says, into 30 different bins. So it said you could pick a better win better value with bin width. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll also center the points at the middle of the violin distribution. So we'll do bin width equals 0 0.5. We might alter that later. And then we'll do stack dir equals center. And that will stack in the center of the column. Uh, and I'll go ahead and put this show legend on the next line. Go ahead and run that. And so what we see is that at um, 0 0.5, binning the y-axis into units of 0 0.5, we get this shape to the distribution. And that we then get points arrayed or dots arrayed across like, like so. And it kind of fills out the shape of the body. Um, if we do say 0 0.25, if we use a smaller bin width, then the points are proportionally smaller in, in their actual size. So in dot plot, the size of the point, the size aesthetic is proportional to the bin size. Let's go back to 0 0.5. I think that looked uh, a little bit better. And again, we can see that the violin body follows the shape of the data. One place where it seems to be a little bit off the rails is that it doesn't quite know what to do with the data kind of down towards the bottom. Um, and so it, it seems to be kind of fitting some type of spline and kind of bringing that back down. So it's not a perfect representation of the data. Something I'd like to try is let's use the adjust parameter in Geom Violin. So if we set this to 0 0.5, that should cause the shape of the violin to fit the data a little bit tighter. And so you can kind of see, at least for the healthy, that it, it, it's a little bit more form fitting, if you will. Um, these three violins are scaled to have the same area. Uh, and so that our eyes, again, aren't deceived by one having more area than the other. Um, and so again, it's kind of fitting splines to fit the violin shape body. And so I think as you use that smaller adjust factor, yeah, it maybe hugs the data a little bit tighter, but it also kind of makes it look a little bit more squiggly and less well fit for some of the others. So maybe let's do 0 0.75. And that looks a little bit better, um, I, where I think that the, the curves fit of the violin matches the data a little bit nicer. Um, so let's, let's stick with that adjust value. Now, again, as I was mentioning, one of the challenges with this visual is that my eyes are comparing where it's the widest, where, where is the, where's the, the, the most area within each of these three violins. And so I'm seeing it here for healthy, down here for diarrhea and C. diff neg, and up here for diarrhea and C. diff positive. I can fix that perhaps by including some quantiles. And up in, as an argument to Geom Violin, I can say, um, draw quantiles 
and I can then give it a vector of values where I want to draw the quantile. So I can do 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. And that then gives me horizontal lines to indicate where the quantiles are. Um, those aren't so pronounced. Maybe if I made my alpha for the body, say 0 0.5, that looks okay. Um, I'm not totally loving having the 75th and 25th percent quantiles. I'd kind of like that to pop a little bit more, um, but it, it's just not doing it for me. Um, let's put the 0 0.5 to draw the median. So again, now we have the median line. And so the median we can see, although again, I'm more drawn to the shape than that median line. Um, and I'm not, I'm not totally sure this violin is doing it for me. Um, I might try with making that bolder, um, but I can't, I can't change the boldness within Geome Violin. I might say like, let's do size equals two. What that does is it makes all the lines bold, which is pretty hideous. Uh, so let's turn that off. Um, I'm gonna turn off the quartiles. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncomment our old friend stat summary, and I will do um, fun median, and I'm gonna get rid of the fun args. And I'll do geom crossbar. And so if I only give fun equals median and then geom crossbar, it will draw the crossbar, the median line, and be quite thick. Uh, I'll leave that. Let me turn off the width for now. Um, and so let's give this a run and see what it looks like. And so we see that we've got those wide bars um, across the data along with the, the violin shaped body. Eh, <laughs> I'm really not feeling it. Uh, um, I think, you know, I'm going to turn off the adjust for now and see what this looks like. It's not so jittery um, in the shape of the violin body. You know, I don't know that the violin body with the data drawn with the dot plot really gets me that much more than having the dot plot on its own or maybe even the, the jittered data with, with the Geom box plot. Um, and so, you know, I make an episode about Geom violin and maybe where we end up with is something like this. Um, I don't know, maybe having the violin was nice. I think, you know, I'm really more of a fan, I think, of having the box plot with the jittered data. Um, what would happen if we took the geom dot plot with the geom box plot? So let's let's give that a shot. And I'm gonna turn off, uh, is kind of a rectangular version of the violin plot, obviously. Um, you know, perhaps we'd bring it in a little bit to make it a little bit tighter. You know, I, so let, let's compare, um, let's go back to the violin and we can compare what we like and what we don't like about these different representations. So I think this is about one of our best representations of the violin plot. And we might compare it also with what we had for um, the, the box plot with the jittered data. What do we like or not like about these two different depictions? One of the things I like about the violin plot de depiction because we use the geom dot plot is that we see all of the data. We don't have to worry about overplotting if we have a lot of data. That is a problem with the jitter plot. And it's probably more of a problem uh, because we have so much data, right? We have you know 100 points, 155 points in that first column. Um, the other thing I like about the dot plot depiction is that it puts the points right next to each other and it centers it on that, that column on the x-axis. Um, Whereas with, again, this, the jitter plot, things are, they're randomly distributed across the x-axis within each category, but they're not evenly distributed, right? We don't, at, at, for one value of y, we don't see things kind of evenly distributed. Uh, we've got kind of clusters within, within you know, each, each grouping. The, the downside, though, is that to get that, that dot plot effect in, in the, the violin plot, is that we had to bend the y-axis um, to make it a, a more of a discrete variable rather than a continuous variable. In the, in the long run, I don't know that that actually matters, um, but we are removing some signal from the data. Um, we're removing some of the, the variation that we see to get things to kind of go into those bins. So that's a trade-off. Another challenge that I see with the shape of the violins is that in this case, I have 155 healthies, 89, and 94 in my two other categories. And so, I mean, just roughly speaking, we have twice the number of points for healthy as we have for the two other categories. And so I can make the violin fit 
the shape of the dot plot for the healthy. But for the two others, it's not a, it's not a good fit. But what it's trying to do is preserve um, the area because we don't want our viewer to be thinking like, well, those violins are different areas. That means they have different um, importance, right? Or different, that that's some variable we should be keeping track of. But instead, when I look at this, I'm thinking like, well, why doesn't the violin fit the shape of the data? Um, why doesn't, you know, why don't I see more like that? Why does it kind of form like a bulb on the bottom? Um, and so I feel like the violin is is giving information that's not really there and it's confusing the audience. This also might be another case, kind of like the, the jitter plot, um, that your audience might not be familiar with it and because they're not familiar with it, it's causing confusion and it's making things less clear. It's So it might be an act of empathy not to use the violin plot or to maybe use it much more sparingly um, when, when you have more even uh, distribution of samples across your different categories. I also think if, if you only had, say, five to ten points, I don't think the violin plot really uh, is appropriate because I don't know that you can fit the shape of a distribution around five points. Whereas, again, you know, if you're showing those five points, um, yeah, like the, the 75th percentile, the 25th percentile, that's probably overstated as well um, in that case. So I don't know. You let me know <laughs> down below in the comments. You can probably tell from my reaction that I'm a little bit torn. Um, Frankly, I prefer the box plot to the violin plot, but some of my self-reflection is, is that because that's that's what we've always done um, and that perhaps we need to get with the times, I need to get with the times and accept the violin plot. But I do, I do feel like there's things going on in the violin plot that are causing confusion, uncertainty, that have nothing to do with comparing these three different groups. It's more about me trying to figure out what's going on with the violin. Um, whereas I don't have that situation so much with the box plot. Like I said, tell me down below in the comments what you think, um, and, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, hopefully this has been a fun discussion of thinking about how we can combine some new approaches to visualizing the distribution of data along with the data themselves. Some trade-offs of using both approaches. Um, you know, I think again that the violin plot does emphasize more of the mode of the data or the distribution of the data than it does really the central tendency. Um, and, and we could kind of see that in the, the example we had here. Whether you ditch box plots and move to violin plots, uh, perhaps a more of a matter of personal preference, but I would encourage you to be mindful of your audience and what their reaction is going to be upon seeing this. And I think that is a is a good opportunity to remind you that I would generate both of these plots, show them to somebody that might be in your audience and ask them what they think. What do you take away from these different um, depictions of the data? What are, what is your initial thought when you see these data? And if it's not like comparing the three different groups, then maybe go back to the drawing board and how you're designing your visual. Anyway, enough pontificating from me on that. Um, please tell your friends about these episodes. Try to engage the material with them and asking them to help you figure out what is the best way to represent the data. Stay tuned for the next episode. Be sure you've subscribed and we'll see you next time.